Thank you, Dr. Thompson, for your kind remarks. And I offer my sincere appreciation to the entire Women's Studies program here at ETSU for supporting this award and honoring women across our great university. It's truly an honor to be included in the list of amazing and notable women awardees over the past 17 years. I want to offer my love and appreciation to Dr. Stacy Brown, Professor of Pharmaceutical Sciences, who nominated me for this award. And so that leads me to my comments for this evening. As you can see, I've titled my discussion with you tonight, There's No I in Team, a Reflection on Growth and Development in Academia. In my 28 years being in the profession of pharmacy, I've been incredibly blessed and fortunate to have been part of remarkable teams in every part of my life. The truth of the matter is that those teams have allowed me to accomplish my goals and to be an agent of change on the regional, state, and national levels. It's really difficult to express in words how thankful I am to these team members, but I'm going to do my best as I take you through my journey over the next few minutes. On the next slide, you're going to see a quote from Helen Keller that says, alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much. Andrew Carnegie, the famed philanthropist, once said, teamwork is the ability to work together toward a common vision. The ability to direct individual accomplishments toward organizational objectives. And this is the part I really like. It's the fuel that allows common people to attain uncommon results. Teamwork is that fuel that allows common people to attain uncommon results. And so let me tell you about my teams and what teamwork has meant to me in my career and my successes. So I'm gonna begin with my nuclear team. This is my family. Here in this picture, you can see my husband, Hughes, and my daughters, Maggie and Claire. As many of you are aware, Hughes passed away three months ago following an extremely tragic motor vehicle accident that occurred while he was having a medical emergency. Never would I have imagined receiving this award without him sitting in the front row with a proud and loving look on his face. And so talking about our Melton team is pretty difficult because honestly, not a single second of every minute of each day goes by where I don't miss him as my best friend, my number one supporter, and my teammate for life. So many of you attended the celebration of life and you heard me tell the story of our romance and our marriage. We were married for 24 years and during that time working together with common passions and goals to serve the medically underserved, just became our way of life. It's just what we did. It's what we did together, and we were able to accomplish amazing things, tremendously more than we would have ever been able to accomplish individually, especially in advocating and caring for those with mental illness and those with substance use disorders. I'm so incredibly thankful for those years where we were able to make a difference across the southwestern part of Virginia and the whole Commonwealth of Virginia as a whole. And you know what's really neat is Hughes and I were each other's cheerleaders. I'll be honest, I don't like talking about my accolades and my accomplishments, but I did love to tell the world about his, and he loved to tell the world about mine. And I love to talk about the difference he was making in this world. And so I worked on this presentation. I had to think, well, what would Hughes say? because he and I always wanted our work to inspire others to join the team and, and to be change agents. And I guess if I can inspire any one of you to step out of your comfort zone to be more of a change agent, then I will certainly have accomplished my goal this evening. And speaking of change agents, this is Maggie. Maggie is 21 years old and she's in her fourth year at the University of Virginia. She's majoring in global public health and minoring in anthropology. She'll finish her master's in public health next year and she hopes to attend medical school. The picture on the right shows Maggie in South Africa this past summer where she went to research the role of the father 
in different towns surrounding Cape Town. Maggie uses the best qualities from Hughes and from me to make a difference for those who so desperately need it. She truly has a servant's heart. And this is Claire. Claire turned 18 in August. She received an appointment to the United States Air Force Academy and to say she is thriving is an understatement. Claire's an amazing leader in her squadron and she's incredibly happy with her decision to serve our country. She hopes to major in political science, attend law school, and then serve in the JAG Corps. Again, Claire demonstrated her desire to serve from a very young age. I'm so incredibly proud of these young women and count them among my most notable accomplishments. Certainly being their mother has brought me incredible joy. Their support and understanding when my service would take me away from them on weekends to RAM clinics, prescription drug misuse forums, national meetings, among others, honestly was really the key to my success in these areas. And so here's the rest of my family. These are my parents, Margaret and Sam Tollison, along with my younger sisters, Julie and Katie. My parents, Julie and my niece, Molly, are here this evening, and I am so glad they're here to share in this special time. It's important for me for you to understand the story of my parents and how it directly impacted my journey. My parents were born and raised in Buchanan County in Virginia. Both had fathers that were coal miners, and they grew up in large families. And so from the beginning of life, I grew up knowing and understanding the ways of life in rural America. They left Grundy at the age of 17 and 18 and went directly to New York City, where my father served in the US Army. They eventually came back to Virginia where my father began, began a job as a bank teller and my mother served as an administrative assistant at General Electric. My father moved steadily up the banking profession and retired as president and CEO of First National Bank of Christiansburg, which was the largest independent bank in Virginia at that time. My mother was named Secretary of the Year at the meeting of the National Secretaries Association in Roanoke about eight years before I was born. Both were able to achieve great accomplishments without a four-year college degree, which was always incredibly inspirational to me. I grew up knowing that hard work was a must, it was a necessity in life, and I knew my parents wanted to provide me with opportunities that they were not afforded. I am so incredibly thankful for how I was raised, with lots of love, support, and an expectation of hard work and doing the right thing always. While I always tell my students to avoid speaking of religion and politics, I have to thank my parents for taking me to church every Sunday, encouraging involvement with our youth group and cultivating my faith. That faith is a very important part of me, the reason for my strength in difficult life situations, and I want to acknowledge my appreciation for my parents making it an integral part of my life. One thing that I always remember were trips back to Buchanan County and seeing the great need there for quality medical care. It really made me interested in serving the medically underserved. And so it's interesting how my entrance into academia began in Buchanan County with a new college of pharmacy with a mission to train pharmacists that would stay in rural areas. My parents and sisters, notable women in their own right, were the team that gave me the support and encouragement I needed on my journey in the profession of pharmacy. And here's my family. <laughs> family is our way of saying pharmacy family. Every day I come to work, I'm surrounded by colleagues that are truly like my family. They offer love, support, and encouragement in all circumstances. This team is powerful, supportive, and together we're making headlines on the national level for the achievements of our students and our faculty. I love the mission of the Gatton College of Pharmacy, which is to develop progressive team-oriented pharmacists that improve healthcare, focusing on rural and underserved communities. That's really everything my career and service in pharmacy has been about. And wanting to feel, fulfill this mission on a daily basis is a real motivator for me. And so here's the beginning in 1994. This is the beginning of my entering the world of clinical pharmacy at the Virginia Commonwealth University 
back then was called the Medical College of Virginia when I entered the Doctor of Pharmacy program in the class of 1994. This was followed after I had received my Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy in 1991. I worked for a year in community and hospital pharmacy and then decided to return to school to get the Doctor of Pharmacy degree. As you can see, I had a small class of nine class members and we are all close to this day, supporting each other from afar in all of our many endeavors. After I finished my fellowship, my uh, PharmD program, I entered a fellowship. I was very fortunate that my mentor that you're gonna hear about in just a minute was able to get funding for a two-year fellowship in psychiatric pharmacy practice where I was able to spend a year in clinical practice and a year doing research. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about my time going between two different colleges of pharmacy and how academia uh, my, my time here has um, really developed over time. My time at the Appalachian College of Pharmacy, which is located in Oakwood, Virginia, was my entrance to academia, and I liken that to drinking from the fire hose. <laughs> I was able to join the team at ACP from the ground up, developing curriculum, assisting with establishing rotation sites for the students, and learning the ins and outs of the accreditation process. The best part of that career, part of my academic career, though, were meeting, teaching, and mentoring the students that came to that institution to learn how to provide care for those in medically underserved rural areas. If you haven't figured it out, that's the type of care I'm all about. In the very first class that entered the Appalachian College of Pharmacy was a student named Jackie. Jackie's my age, and I quickly noticed her maturity, poise, and her skill set and her passion for pharmacy, and her passion especially for the citizens of Russell County. She really did have the skill set to be a clinical pharmacist, but she had two young children that were twins. So she was unable to do a residency program. And so we made a training program for her at the clinic where I was providing comprehensive medication management in Lebanon, Virginia. So Jackie worked directly with me for a year while she learned the skills needed to be an ambulatory care pharmacist. We developed an innovative clinical pharmacy program unheard of in rural areas or really in any part of Virginia at that time. Jackie went on to be board certified in ambulatory care pharmacy and is now a very, very successful as a clinical pharmacist at the program of all-inclusive care of the elderly in Cedar Bluff and also as a specialist in women's health. I share that story with you as an example of how women have the ability to mentor and care for the professional development of other women and to be innovative in the process by thinking outside the box in how we do so. I began my work at the ETSU Bill Gatton College of Pharmacy before my contract officially started. Dean Emeritus Larry Calhoun asked me to start early by advising a new committee under the American Pharmacists Association Academy of Student Pharmacists umbrella. This committee is called Generation Rx, and if you don't know the work of this group of amazing students, you must be living under a rock or you never look at social media one. <laughs> I remember from my first meeting with Chris Lopez and Jake Peters for a brainstorming session that these two young men were going to make a difference and to change lives. And so that was the beginning of a committee that from the first year was recognized nationally for our efforts in the education and outreach around prescription drug misuse. You'll hear more about this amazing group of students and how advising them has truly been my favorite part of academic pharmacy in my journey. From even before I was officially a buck at ETSU, I was allowed the opportunity to be innovative without restraints and with encouragement from my dean, Larry, and my chair, Ralph Lugo. I describe my time during the first couple of years at Gatton College of Pharmacy as it being my dream job. And honestly, that description still holds true to this day. When Larry retired to service... <laughs> On main campus with President Noland, our new dean, Dr. Debbie Bird, was very instrumental in my professional development by continuing what Larry had begun with encouragement, a culture of teamwork, and a cultivation of excellence. 
I convey my deepest appreciations to our administrative team, to Larry, to Debbie, and to Ralph for their key roles in helping me to develop into the family, the faculty member I am today. In 2016, I was promoted to full professor of pharmacy practice, and now I'm considered a senior faculty member. That role brings a lot of responsibility in mentoring others, and I think it's important you hear about my journey from going from being a mentee to a mentor. At its core, being a mentor is being a trusted advisor. Being a mentor involves making yourself available to support and advise someone when they need it, delivering that support in a way that makes sense to them, and always keeping that person's best interest in mind. That certainly describes the mentor that I have had since the early 1990s. This is Cynthia Kirkwood, or Cindy, who currently serves as Executive Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Professor at the School of Pharmacy at Virginia Commonwealth University. Once again, it's really difficult to put into words how special Cindy is to me and how instrumental she's been in my success and my development. Everyone really needs a Cindy in their life. Cindy's a board-certified psychiatric pharmacist and nationally known for her work in this area. Cindy made sure I was able to receive key opportunities to present at national meetings, write book chapters, work with her on exciting research projects. She helped me start my leadership on the national level with the College of Psychiatric and Neurologic Pharmacists. Really, I learned how to be an academician from her. My interest in team-based learning, and here's the, the team part again, stemmed from Cindy starting it at VCU and telling me I should look into it as a pedagogical and innovative way of teaching, and so I did. And I will never willingly go back to the standard lecture style of teaching. You see, the team-based model, and once again, this is how real life is lived, and I think students find it a valuable way to learn and to retain information. And so I offer my deepest appreciation to my mentor, Cindy, who to this day checks in monthly to see how I'm doing and to see how she can help. And so let's move on to some of our mentees that I have. Really one of my greatest joys in academia serving as a mentor. Just as Cindy taught me, guiding others in our profession is of key importance. Over the past 10 years, I've had several students who have completed postgraduate year one residencies with the goal of becoming a psychiatric pharmacist. I've so enjoyed sharing in their successes over the years. Here we have Caroline. Taylor, Jake, Holly, and Jennifer, who are now, Taylor will be finished in, in, in July, but they're all practicing psychiatric pharmacists now in rural areas. And this kind of makes me feel like a grandmother, but on the left is Gary. Gary was in one of the very first classes that I ever taught, and he went on to become a psychiatric pharmacist and he just mentored Jennifer through her PGY2 in psychiatric pharmacist. And so it, it came full circle, which is really neat to me. And here we go, my agents of change, my Generation Rx committee. These students are known across the country, and I literally mean the country, for their education in the community about prescription drug misuse and safe medication use. We are such a powerful team as we fight the opioid epidemic by making sure everyone knows about the life-saving medication naloxone and how everyone should carry this medication on their person. We are known to work the importance of naloxone into any type of conversation, <laughs> smiling at each other as we do so. And so you see, I just did it again. <laughs> Our outreach in our community is saving lives, and I could not be more proud of this group of students. I think to understand the way I live and operate in academia, it's important to hit the highlights of the ins and outs of teaching, clinical practice, scholarship, and service. And so I want to share with you my teaching philosophy. My mission is to be an educational leader who is caring, competent, and collaborative in order to facilitate lifelong learning, proficiency, and independence in my learners. And from that, my vision is to prepare my students for a rapidly changing profession by equipping them with critical thinking skills, 
a love for their patients, and respect for the core values of honesty, integrity, compassion, excellence, and professionalism. And I feel like my core teaching um, attributes include my enthusiasm and passion for certainly mental health and the, the treatment of the disease of addiction, making my learners the center of everything, so learner-centered uh, learning, doing it on a level of excellence, making things patient-centered so that they're able to apply what they learn in the classroom easily to the patients that they encounter, and doing this with compassion and integrity. So teaching over the years, I have had great joy in uh, doing things in an interprofessional way. Interprofessional education uh, really is something that I have found a passion for since the very beginning because that's how we work in teams of interprofessional agents. So I've taken students on introductory and advanced practice experiences in the clinical setting, residents, fellows, and other healthcare providers in the clinical setting or through continuing medical education programming, and also teaching laypersons in the community. I try to be innovative with my teaching. And through one of these ways is through using the team-based learning that I mentioned. In my class that we're in the middle of right now, we also do biweekly conference calls where we do check-ins on Sunday night. They usually have their exams on Tuesdays. So they're able to check in, make sure everyone's doing okay, and see what we need to focus on for the upcoming week. We also do weekly check-in emails with the class. And we learn outside the classroom through social media. So here I have an example of Slack that we're using, and I bet my other students um, in the P3 class are maybe on it right now. <laughs> but this is just an example from last year, how I'm able to send them questions out in the evening, and through the app, they're able to ask, answer me back. And so we do continuous learning, whether we're in the classroom or not. And I found that really reinforces the concepts that um, I'm teaching. One of the things that I've really loved being innovative with is doing our lunch and learns. And as I speak, we're having a supper and learn right now back at the College of Pharmacy. Tonight's topic is on suicide prevention, and they're watching Kevin Hines' uh, documentary on the ripple effect. But through the College of um, Psychiatric and Neurologic Pharmacists, we do lunch and learns uh, about once to twice a week. And what we do with that is we're really bringing real life into meeting didactic learning. And so patients with seizure disorders or Parkinson's disease, an alcohol use disorder or opioid use disorder, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or depression, they come into the classroom and they talk to the students about what it's like to live with uh, that disease state. And so that day when we actually start learning about the disease state, they're able to put a face so the patient isn't a disease, they're the real patient. And so uh, I've been very fortunate to be recognized for my teaching innovation uh, here at ETSU um, and, and hope to continue uh, innovating over the next 10 or so years. Now, experiential and clinical teaching is also a love of mine. You heard about my practice at the Johnson City Community Health Center and the ETSU Center of Excellence for HIV AIDS. And at both of those sites, I have amazing teams that have allowed me to collaboratively work with providers to provide one-on-one -on -one care for patients with mental illness or the disease of addiction. High Power is a um, opioid treatment program that I opened with my husband in Southwest Virginia. So I spent a lot of time there, and that was a collaboration that he and I shared, and our students still go back uh, to take part of that uh, clinic as well. And as you can see, I not only precept pharmacy students, I also take residents and fellows, and I also have a social work intern every year. And we offer uh, shadowing opportunities for first-year students and psychiatric nurse practitioner students as well. Again, introducing that team effect for better learning, no matter what setting you're in. I was fortunate with the American Pharmacists Association who found my practices to be innovative. Um, and so th they were able to recognize and, and interview me about some of the innovative things I do in the clinical realm. And uh, I'm very appreciative of that because that really brought a highlight to what psychiatric pharmacists can do as a bridge to uh, visits with specialists in psychiatry. 
um, at the physician level. So I'm very proud of that national recognition that we were able to obtain. And one of my loves is to provide continuing education for lifelong learnings. And so over the past few years, we've worked with um, a team that have provided about six to seven hours of CE over weekends on Saturdays and Sundays for interprofessional groups, including physicians and nurse practitioners and physician assistants, pharmacists, social work, and others, um, where we we work as a team of five and we bring the interprofessional approach in the continuing education process. We get granting grant funding from the Virginia Department of Health and we do four sites uh, across the Commonwealth every year. We've trained over 3,000 healthcare practitioners over the past eight years. And next weekend, I'll be in Hampton at the School of Pharmacy there to bring our programming there. I've also been able to work directly with the Medical Society of Virginia on opioid risk evaluation and mitigation strategies. And the College of Psychiatric and Neurologic Pharmacists I consider um, to be another full-time job. I've told them they really should pay Ralph you know, part of my salary. Um, I am going on my 10th year of being the chair of the recertification editorial board. And for board certification in pharmacy, to maintain that board certification, you have to do a lot of continuing education over seven years, so at least 100 hours, or you have to retake the examination. So I've been in the one in charge of that recertification programming for psychiatric pharmacists where we develop 15 hours of high-level continuing education every year. And this is my last year, so I am going to be turning that mantle over to uh, my dear friend Beth. So my, a little bit of my research was mentioned in the introduction, and I think part of my favorite part of research was done with someone in the audience, um, which is who's Dr. Michelle Lee. We worked together with an um, interprofessional education for advanced practice nursing, building advanced practice nursing capacity for the interprofessional management of multiple chronic conditions, and this brought students from every part of the professions, the healthcare professions in at ETSU and the Academic Health Sciences Center where they would actually see patients on their own and then come present to us um, as faculty members. And then we would track outcomes during that time. Unfortunately, that grant funding has expired, but I will always remember those times as, as one of my favorite interprofessional times in clinic. Other things that I've been really fortunate to work in have been, of course, the naloxone training. Um, we did an education and outreach project to emulate Project Lazarus from North Carolina to, to replicate that in Southwest Virginia and receive funding from Cardinal Health to do that. While I was at the Appalachian College of Pharmacy, um, I was also able to develop what we called AWARE Rx, which was a comprehensive educational program for pharmacy professionals in Appalachia to fight prescription and over-the-counter drug misuse. And we received a large grant from the Appalachian Regional Commission that allowed me to develop a comprehensive website for education for pharmacy professionals. With regard to my work in uh, substance use disorders, I've really over the past few years been very fortunate to work on the national level with some of the best in our profession to write journal articles focusing on the opioid crisis, neonatal abstinence syndrome, and really the interprofessional work in my community health center. The book chapters I've been able to write focused on screening uh, for substance use disorders, diversion of controlled substances, caring for women with opioid use disorders, and anxiety disorders. Past year, I was fortunate enough to be able to write articles that were published in the California Dental Society, and those education programming that we developed now is, is being sent to dental associations across the country. So not only did California benefit from that, but all states are now getting copies of, of that journal. And along the same lines, before we, we went to the, to the California American Dental Association to work on those articles, 
I collaborated with another team where we developed in a book the ADA Practical Guide to Substance Use Disorders and Safe Prescribing. So that's really, I think that book has changed the way that dentists are prescribing opioids now. And I'm gonna finish up with talking about service because really I feel like that's where my heart is all the time, no matter where I am. So with regard to the university and college committee work, I have been fortunate to serve on the health and wellness committee at the university level, be a part of the prescription drug abuse and misuse work group, and the mental health and addiction work group that um, was formed with the merger between Mel Wellmont and Mountain States Health Alliance. And I continue to serve on multiple committees within the College of Pharmacy. I serve as faculty advisor for Generation Rx that you've already heard about and the College of Psychiatric Neurologic Pharmacists that really uh, I have to t give my um, kudos to them. I now have over 20 members and are in the community almost every other week doing something to raise awareness about mental illness and fighting stigma. Uh, so I'm very proud of uh, their efforts. With regard to service to the profession on the national level, I talked to you about my involvement with CPMP, which I hope to continue. And I, as I transition this year off the research board, I have taken over the uh, huge role of being the lead editor on an opioid use disorder curriculum that will be launching in December. So it'll be 20 hours of continuing education for pharmacists, no matter the practice setting, to learn about opioid use disorder and how to integrate skills into their practice. I served as the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy Substance Use Disorder Special Interest Group Chair, where we were able to accomplish quite a bit over my two-year tenure. And I think one of the highlights that I've had while I have been here at the Gatton College of Pharmacy when I, was when I was able to testify in, in front of Congress at the Investigation and Oversight Subcommittee of the Congressional Energy and Commerce Committee. I know while I was doing that, a lot of my friends back here were watching on the live stream, and so that was pretty neat uh, to know that. And so when I talked, I really focused on the Commonwealth of Virginia, looking at the growing problems of prescription drug and heroin abuse, and looking at the state and local perspectives. I am finishing up my work on the national level with the National Quality Forum with the Opioid and Opioid Use Disorder technical expert panel. So our report will be coming out in the next couple of weeks. And again, as working with 29 other experts in the, on the national level, it's been amazing to watch the teamwork with that come together um, for such an important topic. And you mentioned my work on the state level. I have uh, really enjoyed my work on the governor's task force, both in Virginia and Tennessee, and giving back to both of these great states. Uh, with the Virginia Foundation for Healthy Youth, they have now taken on a additional a part of their mission to look at opioid use. So I, I hope to engage with them again to help with their activities. And currently I'm working with the Department of Medicaid and Medicare Services on their Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee, shaping the way that prescription medications are prescribed and uh, dispensed through Medicaid in Virginia. And so I have to tell you about One Care of Southwest Virginia where I've chaired for the past 10 years. I took over from John Dreisner that many of you know, who just served as our Commissioner of Health in Tennessee. So I had big shoes to fill, literally. Um, and so if you look at One Care Service Area, it's the Brown Park, we cover all of Southwest Virginia. And so as a substance abuse collaborative, we bring substance abuse co coalitions together to really to provide education, data, and outreach across that area with regard to opioid use disorder and just really education of healthcare professionals. Here, if you have time, you should watch some of the, the newscasting. When I talk about teamwork, one of my greatest joys is when one of my students is interviewed by our media. This video that it has been, that I have the link for will just bring a smile to your face because you're able to see how students have come together to, and this was really with naloxone again, to make such a difference in our community. And so I'm gonna conclude by talking about the future. 
because that's what you really, you have to address the future as you're you know, leaving after such an honor. So what are my plans? What paths will I follow? The simple answer to that really is that I'm going to continue my work here at the Gatton College of Pharmacy at ETSU. My notable accomplishments have all been possible by working with the teams where I've landed with them either through hard work, networking, luck, or divine intervention. I love my work with the medically underserved and plan to continue to provide mentorship to students who want to follow this path. In Generation Rx, we always end our presentations in the community by asking those to take something they have heard and let it motivate them to become an agent of change in their community. And I guess that's what I want to continue doing, is being that agent of change and to continue creating new ones who can continue the hard work to make a real difference in the lives and communities that surround us. And really, who could ask for any more than that? Thank you for letting me share my story.